Welcome to the Ringer Podcast Network. I'm Liz Kelly. With the Super Bowl in the books, I wanted to let you know about all of our coverage across the site. We have Kevin Clark, Robert Mays, Roger Sherman, and more breaking down every aspect of the game, including winners and losers, key plays from the game, and the halftime show performance. Also, make sure to check out our YouTube channel where Kevin Clark talked to Amari Cooper on Slow News Day, and Roger Sherman chatted with players from each team for their thoughts leading up to the game. Be sure to watch and subscribe to our channel on youtube.com slash The Ringer. I want them all. I want all the Warriors. I want them alive if possible, if not wasted, but I want them. Send the word. The Warriors coming up next. These are the armies of the night. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Warriors, you guys are the big dudes, huh? Now they're in the Bronx. We're going back. 27 miles behind enemy lines. It's the only choice we got. They've got one chance. They've got one night. The Warriors. All right, Bill Simmons is here. Shea Serrano is here. What up, what up? Sean Fantasy is here. Hello. It's the 40th anniversary of the Warriors coming up in February. February 9th, and uh, we are going to do a podcast about, in my opinion, one of the greatest action movies of all time. Okay. It's top top seven, top eight for me. It's interesting that you would even, call, I don't even know if you can call it an action movie anymore. What would you call it? A thriller? It's like a gang movie. Yeah. A gang? Is it, I don't know if that's a genre. <laughs> that's definitely a genre. I don't know if I could search for that on Netflix. Well, I have two like theories about it. Okay. One is totally ripped off from the director, Walter Hill, who's basically thinks of it as a comic book movie. So it's a comic book movie without superpowers. He's a little too over the, or he was a little too over the top of that. He's idea. very- Is he alive? He's alive. He's very yeah. excited about that idea. So that's from him. And the other kind of movie is, it's basically West Side Story without the musical numbers. Yeah. You know, it's a very like balletic, choreographed, unrealistic portrait of how gangs operate, mm -hmm. you know? But it, I don't know, it's very stylized. It's a very high level. It's not, it's not like the Fast and the Furious. It's not like- I don't know, Cobra, you know, it's, it's not like, uh, our class, it's not Terminator 2. There's something, I don't know, kind of ridiculous about it in a way <laughs> that, that makes it really fun. You know, it's supposed to be both gritty, but there's guys dressed up like baseball players wearing face paint. And you know? mimes. And mimes. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go over the gangs later. Shay, I made you watch this. You hadn't watched it in a while, Correct. but your dad loved it. He loved it. And, uh, so you jumped into it. Yes. What were your thoughts? I, my thoughts is, it's in my top 250 action movies. <laughs> wow, you're, you're down on it? <laughs> yeah, it was not great. Th this is a movie that you, I feel like you have to have watched it when you were a kid. Mm, that yeah. way when you watch it now, you're like, you have those feelings about it because you watch it now and you're like, oh, this baseball bat fight scene, pretty <laughs> terrible. You can see them counting. One, two, three, four. Okay, your turn. One, two, three. Like, I, I get it. I'm, I'm used to now Watching is Shay down in Wick. the Baseball Furies fight scene? I think so, yeah. This I is think unbelievable. Yes, yeah. it is. This is your hottest take of all time. Okay. Four against nine? <laughs> yeah. The Fury, the Furies running through Central Park? Yeah. There were a lot of parts that I just didn't, was like, if I had seen it when I was a kid, yeah. I would have liked it. The, the, the one thing I thought about when I finished watching this movie is I need to call my wife and apologize to her for all of the times I have made her watch like blood sport or kickboxer or any other stuff because i love those she must feel watching you're those. putting blood sport ahead of the warriors absolutely um, see, well that goes to your kid theory. absolutely blood sport is openly terrible i love blood sport but it's terrible for 20 minute stretches There's there are no some way. really bad scenes in that i think you got to put the movie in context to talk about what both of you guys are saying i so, agree so in the 70s action movies were dirty harry enter the dragon the same year that this movie came out, Mad Max came out. If you watch Mad Max, it's a very similar feeling of like, whoa, this is like pretty jankily made and the choreography is weird and all of the things we've come to accept about what an action movie is now, they were just starting to figure out in the mid to late 70s. Well, it was, I think Escape from New York's like that too, very which similar. is an action thriller. Very yeah, similar. I, I grade this on a curve because it's literally 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like when I watch The Warriors, I feel like I'm watching Dr. J highlights or something. <laughs> totally. If, if you watch Dr. J highlights now, 
the way people talk about him, like if you watch the ABA documentary that HBO did um, years ago and people are like, Doc was, he was, he was the one, he was amazing. And now, now it's like just split screen him and Giannis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, Giannis is like Doc on steroids. Looks basically. like a different sport. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that's the case with lawyers. And as Sean said, there really wasn't a lot going on action wise. That wasn't just the one white guy taking down a bunch of guys with a gun Mm -hmm. or Westerns. It was Westerns, cop movies, Kung Fu movies, and black exploitation movies. Those were the action movies of the time. And I feel like this movie in Mad Max kicks off kind of a new era and kind of an era of like expanded universes for lack of a better word. Like there's so many people in this movie and so much mythology in this movie, even if you don't even try to unpack any of it, you know, they're trying to introduce like it's, it's world building, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, there's something really cool about it being one of the first movies that really tried to do that. Cause that's really all movies are in 2019. So it came in 1979 based on Saul Urich's 1965 novel of the same name. Okay. And that was apparently a big novel back in the day. I was not I haven't alive. really had a lot of conversations <laughs> about it in the last 40 years. I think it's one of the better kind of setups for a movie I can remember. You it's, basically a great, have, it's a great idea. There's a gang summit, nine delegates from 100 gangs. They're all going to go into this place in the Bronx and listen to what this guy has to say. No guns. Nobody's going to waste anybody. Let's, let's hear what, what this man Cyrus has to say. Cyrus comes up. He's basically the forerunner of The Rock and Barack Obama <laughs> in 1979. Comes in and he's just the most charismatic, amazing guy. And this was during a time when Jimmy Carter was the president. And we had all of these politicians that were the opposite of this. And this guy comes in, he's just so magnetic. And it's just a great, great premise. And then something goes wrong and the Warriors have to fight their way back to Coney. They have to go 28 miles on the subway with everybody thinking that they did the murder. Yeah, I would say something goes wrong is a kind of a light way of describing yeah, what happens. There's an assassination. <laughs> <It's> assassination. <laughs> with the uh, Jesus Christ, Willem Dafoe, arms spread, oh, falling God. backwards. Such a great stunt. I the, love that shot of him falling through the through the, through the, uh, the the terrace there. It's amazing. So it opened in like 670 theaters. They didn't have a lot of advanced screenings. They didn't really run commercials for it. It did well. million the first week. Then, um, over the next week or so, there's vandalism, there's fights in the theater. Three people are killed at three different locations and everybody freaks the fuck out. I remember this because one of of the places where something bad happened was in Boston Mm -hmm. and it was a huge story and we were living in Boston at the time. And uh, and it was basically like, oh my God, they got it. They can't, they got to ban this movie. And it actually really helped the movie. I was nine years old. I'm like, what's this movie? People are going to kill the theater? This sounds amazing. And I really wanted to see it. And I don't remember the first time. I definitely didn't see it in the theater. My, my parents wouldn't take me. But there was this mystique about it. If you're a kid of the 70s, like this was the movie. They, you know, there was mm-hmm. violence and went crazy. But apparently if you read about it now, the gangs and the people that were going, they were treating it like it was Rocky Three. Right, mm-hmm. And they're cheering during the fight scenes and they're just like losing their fucking minds basically. And it sounds like it would have been a really cool movie theater experience. Definitely. Have you I ever, mean, maybe not for a nine-year-old. Have you been in a theater where people end up cheering at a thing or like celebrating oh God, yeah. before? Yeah. For what movie? I mean, Rocky 2 and Rocky 3 were like that. Was it? Yeah, that was like people were cheering for that. Like that was an actual game. Mm-hmm. Um, this happens all the time now. 48 Hours was like that. I, I've written about this, but I saw 48 Hours in Stanford, Connecticut, and it was a mostly black theater and people lost their fucking minds when the the torture scene in the mm. in the cowboy bar when he's going off on the rednecks. Mm-hmm. It was like people were going nuts. I feel like this is a big thing in Los Angeles. Like if you go to an Avengers movie now on opening night, it's, it's, a, it's a stand up and yell. Like Chris Evans showed up on screen in the last Avengers movie and people were like having a heart attack, mm-hmm. which really? is, yeah, it's, it's different from what you're describing, which I feel like is a little bit more organic as opposed to this kind of coordinated social event where everybody's like, we're going to go, go to Avengers this. tonight and we all dress up and we yell at the screen. It was very similar with the last Star Wars movie too, but there was something a little bit more communal and um, unorganized about cheering at Rocky or cheering at the Warriors, you know? Mm-hmm. Creed. I heard in some places people cheered, especially during the uh, the first one. Yeah, they cheered in my theater. theater I think we didn't people cheer. We cried it. at my theater. You cried? We cried. There was no clapping. 
Let's oh, see. when he went down the yeah, first yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert. Yeah. So by its six week, it had grossed about 16 million, which is a lot. And the critics were behind it. Most interestingly, Pauline Kael, mm. the most influential movie critic at the time, she wrote, The Warriors is a real movie maker's movie. The Warriors is like visual rock. So it does like, it does have pieces of things that we would end up seeing in the 80s, including like that Miami Vice style of the music, like entire scenes without dialogue, really, and things that would eventually become a thing. It's all style. It's costumes. It's music. Colors. It's the lights. It's the colors mm-hmm. in the movie. It's the the visual aspect of it. And, and what Pauline Kill is talking about is totally right on. That's, that's actually why I think it's important. It's maybe not why it's fun. Yeah, but it totally sets a visual template for what movies like this will be. And then the other thing that I think is really fascinating about this movie, I mean, there's other stuff too, but it just, there's this whole 1970s stretch of New York movies that you and I have talked about in the past, but it basically goes from like, I don't know, 72 to 79, where New York is just a character in these movies. And the Woody Allen movies are like that. I think Death Wish is like that. Mm-hmm. Death Wish is like a really distinct New York movie. Yeah. The Sydney um, Lumet movie is Dog the Afternoon and Sir, yeah, Serpico. Yeah, Serpico is another stuff, one. Yeah. There's been a lot of them. And this is really, you really feel New York. You're thinking about the different spots they're in and and especially now how much Brooklyn's changed and they have to, it, did, did the map line up in this movie? I was going to ask you this. I mean, they cut to the subway a lot and they use that as a sort of guidebook for the viewer, but I, I mean, you, you really have to pay close attention to whether the stops are correct. For the most part, it seems like they're correct, but you don't always know which stop they're at. They they shot a lot at one of my old stops when I lived in New York, Ho- Hoyt Skirmerhorn um, yeah. in Brooklyn. And you see that 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 station over and over again. But also those stations look completely different. The subways look completely different. The turnstiles look completely different. The stairwells, like New York subways, they're still hellscapes for sure, but there's something um, unrecognizable in a way about how they are now. So it's kind of hard to track whether you are moving in the right direction the whole th- time throughout the movie. What about the park? That all looks right to me. Because I always wonder how they went from 96th and Broadway to Central Park. Seemed that, that seemed like one of, I guess we could talk about that in nitpicks. It's a little, I mean, the whole travel is a little bit unrealistic. We also don't know, like, what time did the summit start? You know, what time did they leave? <laughs> yeah. And then when they arrive at Coney Island at the end, is it 6 a.m.? Is it 10 a.m.? Like, we don't know how much time is actually going. It is a great all across one night movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the actual, uh, I mean, maybe we should hold it for picking nits. Yeah. Gene Sisko, one star. Tough beat. I like it more than one star. <laughs> Roger Ebert, two out of four stars. I like the two stars. Said, despite Hill's cinematic skill, the film is implausible and the characters lack depth and spontaneity. And he said, he wrote, no matter what impression the ads give, this isn't even remotely intended as an action film. It's a set piece. It's a ballet of stylized male violence. Yeah, yeah. So so I agree with that, yeah. but I think it's good. <laughs> like, yeah. to, to hold that against it, I think is actually a, kind of a weird criticism. Right. So, so I always, I always judge this stuff when you're talking about the movies from the 70s and 80s, by what came before it, what was the degree of difficulty, how original was it, and mm-hmm. things like that. And that's what always strikes me with this movie is like, how do they even think of this? Especially compared to what else was going on at the time. And then to try to pull this off where they're filming at the middle of the night, they're filming with real gang members. They have to come up with the different gangs. It was just really creative. Yeah, on location in New York too, it's really hard. And then Walter Hill, who directed it, he also did 48 Hours. He also did some really bad movies too, but he's one of the most up and down directing careers I think we've had. He's fascinating. I mean, he's he made a movie right before this called The Driver, starring Ryan O'Neill. That's like a more or less a silent film mm-hmm. about a getaway driver hmm. um, that is so interesting and was similarly received. It was like, it didn't do any business, but it, critically there was a split where half the people thought it was a total masterpiece and half the people thought it was like a dull mess. Yeah. And it has now gone on to be kind of a cult film, not as big as The Warriors. Um, and then he went on to make like a lot. He, you know, he made Geronimo. He made Wild Bill. He he went on to make a lot of really interesting movies. He made Streets of Fire, which is a crazy movie. It's like a like a street gang musical. Michael Pere, yeah. Eddie and the Cruisers. Yeah. I like these movies where they have the plot is like you can say it in just one sentence or two sentences. Yeah. I really like those sorts of movies the best. They're easy to follow. They're fun to get into. You're like, oh, it's a, it's a team of mercenaries fighting an alien in the jungle. All right, cool. Yeah, oh, let's go. The one sentence explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you think about action movies from the Warriors going through 
to, let's say, Lethal Weapon 2. What was that, 89? Mm -hmm. Die Hard's 89. 88 is Die Hard. 88 is Die Hard. Lethal Weapon 2, I think, is 89. But just how action movies change from this point right here going all the way through. Mm -hmm. And then we hit like First Blood's 82. First Blood is another one that's an all time classic. You watch it now and it's like, all right. Like if I'm 22 and I watch First Blood, probably doesn't feel as influential as maybe it was at the time. But this whole thing of that's actually like a Vietnam movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's it's not the action movie that you kind of think it is because it eventually turned into Rambo two and Rambo three and all the the Rambo became this uh, America on steroids character. Yeah, you first can bloods s- of Vietnam. I'm traumatized by the war and how do I fit in movie that and and then it kind of goes into action. Yeah, it's the transition out of New Hollywood in the 70s and into the kind of muscular 80s action movie template where the movies didn't actually have to be about anything. They just had right. to be about yeah. the movie itself. the The key person I think in the Warriors here about what you're describing is is Lawrence Gordon, Larry Gordon, the producer of the movie, who spent a lot of time working for Roger Corman in the 60s at American International Pictures, and then goes on basically after the Warriors to make Die Hard. He makes Point Break. He produced all of these kind of like, he's kind of, he's one of the patron saints of the rewatchables. You know, he was mm. involved in a lot of the movies that we really like that we point to and say like, this is what cool action movies are. That was his style, him and Joel Silver and a handful of other people during that time. Um, and you can see that he had he formed a partnership with Walter Hill early on, and they wanted to make movies like this. They wanted to make these masculine, highly stylized action movies that became a template. There's also, uh, it taps into something that was going on in New York in the 70s where New York had kind of lost its mind, and there was a ton of crime. We had even the police strike in 1976, the blackout, Son of Sam by Spike Lee's, or Summer of Sam. What was it? Summer, Summer of Sam? Summer. Yeah, it was... A little bit about this, The Bronx is Burning, Jonathan Mailer's book. New York just kind of lost it and was rudderless and out of control. And this movie kind of fits in with that. You have this gang leader who's basically like, hey, man, if we all get together, like we can run New York. It seems unrealistic now, but in 1979, it, it was unrealistic, but it wasn't like impossible. Right. That all of the gangs could have been like, we can overpower the cops and actually like start some shit. Mm-hmm. Well, what did you guys think of the, the, the math that Cyrus is using at the beginning where he's like, he, he, he was he making it up. Yeah. <laughs> he was making it up. Uh, I you love that. Tell. Where he's they like, dub like all of a sudden it's 20,000 and then yeah. it's 40 and then it's like, that's 60,000 soldiers. Like 20,000 like, loosely affiliated men that we will uh-huh. organize around the yeah. city. <laughs> yeah. There's some flaws in his plan. How does he, how do they set, how do they cut everything up? <laughs> it's really funny. They beat, they beat the cops. Then what happens to the money? They're controlling stuff. Is the National Guard not going to get involved? I don't know if he had thought out really that much, <laughs> but in the moment, it made sense. Yeah. It's like, hey, man, let's, it's 60000 and 20000 We got this. <laughs> <laughs> let's yeah, all that, get together. That checks out. Uh, all right, let's get to the categories. Most rewatchable scenes. And this movie is basically, it's, it's just these six scenes that are really fun to watch over and over again. And then kind of, lagging until it gets to the next mm-hmm. one. Cyrus's speech is amazing. Mm-hmm. I like the platform they built for him. The yeah. l- little wooden thing. They put, they'd gone there earlier and built this little thing that he could climb up. I don't up. think they got a permit for that. <laughs> it they fell did. apart real easy when he <laughs> bumped into the back of it. He's got 900 people there and he's just like, can you count suckers? Everybody's quiet. Yeah. 900 uh, juvenile delinquents and then just rattles off one of the classics. 60 thousand soldiers. Now there ain't but 20,000 police in the whole town. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Apparently when they filmed this, they they just didn't have the money for 900 extras and they actually had to use real gang members. (laughs) And as he's doing the speech, the gang members got really excited and they were like genuinely real. cheering and going crazy. Like that's all genuine. Like uh-huh. they're like, this fucking guy's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's take it. <laughs> so I don't know what happened to that guy. His name's Roger Hill. He was an actor. He worked, yeah. he worked, but this is like an all time performance. It's, it's one of the most, mem- I mean, he says three different things that are just in the lexicon, you know, yeah. um, he's really great. And when the rock became a popular wrestler in the late 90s, it really seemed like he was just doing a Cyrus impersonation. Mm-hmm. What were the three things? Can you count suckers? 
Um, can you dig it? Can you dig it? And I think there's a couple. There's like the future. I say the future is ours if you can count. Is mm-hmm. kind of a famous one. And also, you know, one little piece of turf, you know, the, the him kind of describing to them like what right. their sort of their, uh, their border mentality is. You right. know? That's crap, brothers. Yeah. Ten feet of turf. Mm-hmm. Um, but Can You Dig It is is iconic. And then when this movie had the renaissance in, uh, whenever the video game came out, it was probably like 20 years later. Hit that nostalgia thing. It was like 20, 20, 05, 24 think. years, yeah. something like that. And there was this Warriors Renaissance because it had just been on cable for 20 straight years. And uh, the Cyrus Can You Dig It became, I think there was like a rap song about it, like using, sampling the Can You Dig It. I am a warrior that gets wicked, so tell me. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? And it just kind of had this whole renaissance. Yeah, I mean, all. And it was right after The Rock had really, you know, gone nuts on WWE, too. I just felt like they were linked. Yeah, there's something, it shares a little bit in common with like Scarface, where it was kind of adopted by a later generation in a different way. Yeah. There's obviously the very famous Craig Mack flavoring your ear video with Puffy saying, bad boy, come out and yeah. play. And that's obviously inspired by this. Like, there's just, I think, literally for people that are my and Shay's age, a lot of people who grew up watching it, you know, in their in their dad's living room, um, just absorbed it and started repeating it and not realizing they were repeating it. You know, it's just kind of embedded in the Scarface fabric. is another good one for this. So Scarface was 82 mm-hmm. and was considered a bust when it came out. I was like, what the fuck is this? Why is that? What's going on with Al Pacino's accent? Why is it so long? Why is it so violent? And then it had kind of the same arc that the Warriors did where it hit cable the whatever the laser disc VHS era comes in and it just kind of took a life of its own. Uh, more rewatchable stuff. I love when they're running to the first train station after Cyrus gets shot when they're trying just to get in the Turnbill ACs or driving around in that school bus yeah. with like 25 guys and they're all like kind of hanging out <laughs> with like bats and two white force. <laughs> they, were they already looking for the Warriors at that point? Or is yeah, that I think just they how were. They, I think the word was out. Okay. Yeah. That's just not how they spent kind of their Thursday night, just kind of cruising around 30 guys it on a bus. It might have been. I had a lot of questions about the turbo ACs, <laughs> what was going on with them. Uh, the baseball fury scene, which which Jay, uh, Shay just blasphemed. Mm-hmm. The They come out of the subway. It's it's probably the best moment of the movie. They come out of the subway and Ajax is just like, what the fuck is that? And the camera cuts to these four dudes in baseball uniforms. Why are their faces painted? They're the baseball furies. I mean, that you can't. That's not a question you can no, ask. No, that is a question you should <laughs> ask. I actually, we have, I have that coming up later. Okay. What's going on with them? Are they mimes also? We're going to get to that. Okay. That whole sprinting through <laughs> Central Park. They run for like a mile and then just stop and are ready to fight. And Nobody's fight. Like, <gasps> <Yes>. <laughs> Nobody's like winded. That, that was the only guy in the movie I was like, so you're watching them run all the time. I'm like, these guys fucking are, have good cardio. It's good shape. And yeah. then finally he says that. He's like, I can't run anymore. I'm like, this is who I am in the movie, whoever this guy is. You know, they shot all at night during the movie. And Michael Beck talked a little bit about this on a making of where he just said that, you know, they would shoot all night and then he would go back to his apartment in New York. He would sleep for six hours. He'd wake up at about noon and then just do two hours in the gym before he had to go back to shooting. Because this is like one of the most running movies that have ever existed. They're running in like 12 scenes. They run a lot. It must be exhausting. And you know, when you're making a movie... You're not doing it once. You're doing it 20, 30 times. You know, you have to keep shooting it and shooting it. So how long could you run? Oh, I'd, if I'd be done. Nine guys with baseball bats are chasing you. Like you know if they catch you, it's a fucking ramp. How long? I don't know. You I think you find superhuman strength in those moments, right? But eventually your lungs just must go. I thought um this was like several weeks ago. I was in an airport. Yeah. And I was I had I was in Oregon. Flight got delayed because of fog or whatever reason. I was there for like an extra 20 hours at the fucking airport. Were there I mean, baseball furies in the there airport? There were baseball <laughs> furies waiting outside. It's the TSA. But so I finally flew to like my next spot before I could go home. And as I was getting in, I got the alert that said they're loading this plane here. So I was like rushing. It's a super long airport. I see the terminal I have to get to. It's like half a mile away from where I am. The plane comes in. I get out. I'm fucking booking it as fast as I can. I've been... At the airport at this point for like 20-something hours, I know if I don't make this flight, I'm screwed. And I only made it maybe like a quarter of a mile, and then I was just like, fuck this. I'm going to walk. <laughs> like, I couldn't. It was like whatever. You I could, the baseball I could, Furies. Yeah, I, was, I would get caught really fast <laughs> with the Furies. I don't know. The, there was always like an SNL sketch that never would have happened, but 
where they finally stop running and the furies catch them up. And instead of fighting, everybody's just like, <laughs> hold on a second. Hold right. on. Let's fight. Let's fight in like 90 seconds. I yeah. just got to catch my breath. The, uh, the bathroom battle with the roller skating gang. I like that one. Which they filmed for five days, apparently. <laughs> they really did. It was what? like eight to seven every every day, them just filming all the stunts. I don't know why it was harder to do stunts in the 70s compared to like the John Wick era now. Where... Was that the, the their actual name, the roller skate gang? No, they're called the punks. Oh, okay. Because only one guy had the roller Allegedly. skates. Right. I liked him. I liked the... Check it out if you ever watch it again. The super tall guy. There's like mm-hmm. a six yeah, five yeah, yeah, guy. Yeah. He's kind he's kind of like the Miles Plumley of, of the uh the <laughs> He punks. looked like he would have been trouble in that fight. He should have done a better job in the fight. Warriors come out to play, which was apparently ad libbed by the dude. He grabbed the three bottles. I love that and guy. Did this. David Patrick. I was Kelly. wondering why the Warriors, the actual Golden State Warriors, didn't just do that before every game. I you know, guess they do maybe it. there's they some do gang do com- they, contest. Yeah, I feel done like it. they do it. I feel During like they adopted the it. Feels like that should be their thing flip right. side you know you don't want to be riding for the rogues you know the rogues are an evil gang so maybe the warriors don't want to put their the energy in there out of control. Know, those guys are bad news and then uh the ending where swan basically throws the knife hits the leader of the rogues. The great throw good throw and then it's like riffs and we look up and there's 150 riffs who have just materialized mm-hmm. in silence who are watching from afar and leading to the, you guys are good. The best. You warriors are good. Real good. The best. The rest is ours. That part reminded me of when they do like a, the, a similar thing in Revenge of the Nerds. When the nerds are getting beat up. Yeah. And then the tri all show up and they're all there. Same thing. The Gramercy riffs are, are pretty great in this. Yeah. Great I'll... gimmick. They all know Kung Fu. They have like a number two guy who's ready to go right after Cyrus dies. That's what the I was just going to say. Excellent. Masai just rises up, right? Yeah, Cyrus is dead. And then this guy's just ready to be in charge. He's got yeah. the mirrors, tinted sunglasses. And that guy looks like he was born to be the leader of the Gramercy it's race. Great. Maybe. I mean, there, you could have made the case. Maybe he had Cyrus killed. Oh, wow. Working with the rogues. A little prequel. Yeah. That's Interesting. Fair. Did um, a little pay and that's it. probably why at the end they don't even question anything. They're just like, we have to kill this guy because mm. he knows we set him up. So it's what's the most hear. rewatchable, Sean? Got to be the Cyrus speech. Got to be. That's definitely my favorite part. That's also the scene I've seen the most from the movie. Yeah, I guess. I guess we have to go that one. What about um the fight with the Lizzies? You wouldn't put that on the list. We're gonna get to that okay. one later. Right. I wouldn't totally put that on the list. Okay. I personally like the baseball fear scene most because I like I like when they're running and then they stop and they're like, "Did we lose them?" Mm-hmm. And he's like, I don't think so. And it's just coming over the hill. Is that baseball? The first right. baseball fury guy. He's yeah. a fucking assassin. Um, <laughs> How did you feel about their um, their swing form? You know, the Furies. You feel like they look like they'd be, what are they, like two hitters? Let's you know? do this now. Okay. Because I, I had this for later with, uh, I had this for picking nits. How do they lose that fight? Their whole gimmick is they're a baseball gang. They mm-hmm. have nine guys. All they do all day is swing these bats and practice bat shit. <laughs> and then these four dudes, one of whose goes down right away. The yeah. cowboy goes down mm-hmm. immediately. So it's nine against three. The tired guy. And they fucking get their ass kicked. And it's like, so Ajax does the, I'm going to shove that bat up your ass and may turn you into a popsicle. Fights mm-hmm. the first guy. The other five guys are just like standing there. Yeah. They made that common it's, mistake yeah. that, that you see. So there's some honor here. Like just jump Ajax and beat the fucking shit out of them with yeah. the bats. I mean, terrible maybe, planning. Maybe by they're them. just like more Florida Marlins than Boston Red Sox. You know, like maybe they're just not, <laughs> maybe they're just not talented baseball fighters. Like <laughs> this might be a weak squad, you know, low, low salary. You know, Too much honor. I think you look at the baseball furies and obviously all gimmick, no substance. Yep. Clearly. It was like, you, as you said, you you were wondering why they spent that much time putting makeup on. It was a lot. Of fa- a lot like, of I don't understand the face, but I don't understand why they're not saying any words. I don't understand why they're wearing cleats. So it's basically a bunch of bad athletes who couldn't make their high school team who decide they're going to start this baseball game. They're inspired by the 77, 78 Yankees. Mm-hmm. They're kind of somewhere near the Bronx. They're, what were they, 96? They're near Union Square. Well, I was trying to figure that out with every gang. It's like, is it, so are we supposed to think that the gang correlates to the neighborhood that they're in at that time? I would guess. Because they strike me more as like a little bit of a Murray Hill, like corny white guy gang. You know, they don't strike me as- <laughs> I think they were like, a corny oh, white guy gang. <laughs> yeah, not, not like a gang that would be from Harlem or from the Bronx or from Brooklyn. Like they kind of just struck me as like, 
frat boys who had a bad idea to put on face paint, you know? It's it's like Tyson Douglas. Yeah. Like their whole thing was the bully. And then Tyson always had that thing about everyone has a plan until they get hit. Mm -hmm. The fears are basically like this face paint, baseball uniforms, baseball back in right. is really going to carry us. And then Ajax is like, all right, let's go. I'm going to turn that bat up your, throw it up your ass. Maybe we're just underrating James Remar and what a badass he was. He was incredible. You know, just just really <laughs> full-time heat check from Ajax. We're, we have a lot of James Remar territory to cover. I will say, though, uh, great plan by Swan there. There's four of them running with the baseball furies behind them. They cut around a corner and Swan's like, hey, with me, and grabs the two guys to sneak off. Mm -hmm. And so then they can come behind them and catch the right. one baseball fury who's not totally in shape, right. get his bat and keep going. Amazing. Hey, you might remember Academy Award-winning screenwriter and playwright Aaron Sorkin was recently on my podcast discussing his long career and his great movies and shows that he's been involved with, including The West Wing, The Newsroom, Social Network. Oh, yeah. We talked about all of it. He has a new play on Broadway. It's an adaptation of Harper Lee's Pulitzer Prize-winning To Kill a Mockingbird, which was recently voted America's Best Loved Novel of all time. Not just of 1961 or whatever it was. Of all time. To Kill a Mockingbird has become one of the most popular and toughest tickets to get on Broadway. It set a record as the highest grossing American play in Broadway history. It's also been selected as a critic's pick by the New York Times. NPR called it one of the greatest plays in history. Two-time Emmy Award winner Jeff Daniels stars live on stage as Atticus Finch Variety said, one of the greatest stage successes of this or any Broadway season is not played to a single empty seat, unquote. Rolling Stone said, unforgettable and unmissable. All rise for the miracle that is Mockingbird, unquote. New York Post said, if you want to do one thing for your parents, your grandparents, or your children, and your children, or your children, whatever, buy them tickets to kill a Mockingbird. Better yet, take them yourself. This is what great theater is for, unquote. Well, it's sold out for the next several months, but tickets would make a fantastic Valentine's Day gift when purchased for available performances. This coming summer or fall, tickets are available directly through telecharge.com or the show's website, which is tokillamockingbirdbroadway.com. Check it out. Uh, what's age the best? I really was into Cleon, the uh, original Warriors warlord who, who gets killed after the rogue guy claims that the Warriors shot him. <laughs> that guy with the with the little leopard, the, yeah, 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 leopard head. He's thing awesome. And, he, in the uh, in the in the uncut movie or with the, the deleted scenes, he's actually more involved. He's got more scenes. There's scenes with him and his girlfriend. He was like really good. He gets killed by getting elbowed a bunch of times by twenty five guys. Yeah, I don't understand why they were. That was the move that they all decided to use on him. They all gather around him and they shoot shoot from the top. And then you just see a bunch of fucking elbows getting dropped. I think there Is were, some, they kicks, were fighting? some kicks coming eventually yeah. once he got down. So he dies, you don't know in the movie. but They, they the beat book. him to death? Yeah, they beat him to death. I Jesus. always love the way that he kind of flicks David Patrick Kelly, Luther, off of him oh, when he jumps at yeah. him. That's an amazing move. You yeah. know, he barely even, and then the hard elbow to the face. He's got some He's got some moves. I like Cleon. I kind of was a warlord. Yeah. I know they needed Cleon to die so uh, Swan could take over, but I was into Cleon. I really, yeah. I really, the Cleon reign. Maybe we need a Cleon prequel. Would have been great. You know, the rise of the Warriors. I think the jackets were amazing. The Warriors jackets. The, the vests? vests? Yeah. The vests. Mm, I liked it. Had mm. a fight in those. I like that there's no shirt underneath. It's like, good. Mm. What did you like about it, Sean? Um, I don't know. <laughs> One, I, a vest with no shirt is never going to be a win, in my opinion, unless you're well, a professional wrestler. Disagree. Uh, disagree. Disagree. Would you, would you rock that? I wear it to the beach when we go to the beach. What? I yes. wear a leather. Shut up. It's got two pockets, one for sunscreen, one for my cell phone. <laughs> <And I> just, <laughs> okay. Are you serious? No, it's I'm not man. serious. I'm not serious. I believe that. At all. The uh, vest part, though, that was the one part of the movie that I like <laughs> connected to the most. When they meet the orphans. Yeah. And they're gonna, the orphans are going to let him pass. And then he's the girl comes. I forget her name. What was her name? Mercy. Mercy. It, she's telling them, you know, some kind of man you are. You're just letting anybody. Yeah. And then he tells him you have to take the your your cut off or your colors off. Yeah. But I was thinking, there. I really like Sons of Anarchy. And they wear, they wear a cut. That's what they call it in that show. Yeah. And there are a couple of times where they try to like take it off of them. And you have to die before that happens. Right. I like understood that part. Like, Nobody takes you, the vest. Don't you so. fucking take that off, Swan. Don't you do it. Central Park 
age really. I like Central Park in 70s movies. Mm -hmm. It's just creepy. Nobody's ever there. It just seems like bad things are always going to happen in Central Park. It was very dangerous. Yeah. It was very dangerous at that time. Luther, the leader of the rogues. Just an, an, am an amazing. Over the top villain. Like, uh, just he's going for it. Mm -hmm. I, I think we already know who's going to win the Saul Rubinek. They knew over, or the uh, Saul <laughs> Rubinek they knew over acting award. He's really going for it. He's so evil. You really hate him. Mm -hmm. My son loves watching this movie with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, he loves he loves how over the top that guy is. Right. I love that there's no reason for anything he does. He's just a crazy psychopath. I love it. I love where he, he's just like, because we can. You know, it's, that's his whole attitude for the movie. More movies should just have that. Trying to explain like why a villain does something is a waste of time. The Ooh, Joker. Also anarchy. disagree. I oh, also wow. disagree. Oh my God. I'd need a reason. I you like that reason? guy. Yeah, I like Luther. Though. He's just a sociopath. He was a, one of only two people in the movie that I recognized. I recognized him from Commando, mm -hmm. and I recognized Raiden from Mortal Kombat Two. Remar. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was also Luther was also in Forty Eight Hours and played Luther. Two Same Luthers. was the guy who <laughs> back turned back on uh, Eddie Murphy and, <laughs> and the whole crew. Very purposefully recast by Walter Hill. Yeah, As he's, he's done a lot of stuff. I mean, he was on Twin Peaks. He was on, yeah. um, and then he was on the new Twin Peaks that came out a couple of years ago. He's been in a bunch of Spike Lee movies. Um, yeah. He's a real like Hollywood character actor guy who you'll mm -hmm. see all over the place over the last 40 years. Um, Walter Hill, he just, he hit this zone with this movie in 48 hours of just this kind of early, how a movie should, how an action movie should move with the music, with the soundtrack. 48 hours also had an awesome soundtrack. These right. Both these movies and the soundtrack's another thing. That age really well on this. Barry Devorzen, mm -hmm. who's had a bunch of stuff, but that's like that weird guitar and it just feels very 70s. I will say though, I'm not totally sure that guitars and a big Joe Walsh song to end is necessarily like the sound of mostly black and Hispanic gangs in New York City in the 70s. Like that there is a little <laughs> bit of cognitive dissonance between like a black gang beating up the rogues at the end of the movie and then you hear Joe Walsh's voice. Like that's not, <laughs> those two things. It's weird because it's a good song, but it's also it a like song. a very strange song to end it. Yes. I really like that song a lot. Um, it's just, it's, it's not really the song you'd hear. In the movie's defense, it is 1979. We like literally don't have hip hop rap. I don't, I don't really know what they could have picked. What would yeah. you have gone with? Because like when of... they play Nowhere to Run when they're running, that feels like perfect for the movie. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what they would have ended with on this. I know it shouldn't have been Joe Walsh. I mean... Even though I like that song. You know, we're still a few years away from Grandmaster Flash, I guess. You know, but we're not from Sugar Hill Gang. So it's not like yeah. rap is... Rap is... That was 79 when Sugar Hill Sugar Gang... Sugar Hill Gang would have been amazing. It exists. I mean, that's I probably a little was... too exuberant yeah, maybe for the ending. One. But... I don't well, know, just you, you want like a funk band basically doing something like a hard funk record. I, th I think. Hmm. Um, or I like, like across 110th Street or something like that. Well, that, that, <laughs> that makes more sense to me. I like uh, the orphan scene is too long. I love the the wonk eye orphan leader oh, though. I feel so bad for the, him. How could it be a big meeting if the orphans weren't there? <laughs> I know it's that so poor good. guy. It's funny. He's just, he just had no idea the meeting was even happening. That hurt so. my feelings. Yeah. I like the themes for the uh, different gangs, which we'll get to in a second. The gang DJ is great. Mm, uh -huh. the, uh, there's some gangs. Everybody, there's no internet back then. There's no texting. <laughs> right. There's no Twitter. That was a, that's just a great play, though. from the DJ. Yeah. How do we get this information out to everybody? The coded language. Yeah. The 70s prom couple, that's a weirdly effective scene. Because I think the cool part of this movie for me, having watched it 380 times, is <laughs> it's really about like these guys don't really have any hope. Mm -hmm. And their lives suck and they're, they're fighting to keep whatever. And it's not even, they're not even keeping anything. Mm -hmm. Like when they get back to Coney Island after they fought their way back and one of the guys goes, this is what we fought all night to get back to. They're right. just looking around. It's like the fucking Wonder Wheel. It's like, great. We're home. Awesome. It's kind My of the life act, sucks here. It's the action movie version of uh, The End of the Graduate, you know, where Dustin yeah. Hoffman and Catherine Ross look at each other and they're married and they ran off together and they're like. Now what do we do? Now we have to have the rest of our lives. Our lives are not good. We live in Coney Island. Right. It's amazing. And that 70s prom couple comes in there all happy and they look, they look at Mercy and she's got dirty feet. And then she goes to fix her hair and Swan like stops her. Mm -hmm. it's, that that whole scene's pretty cool. And then uh the uh you guys are real good. The best. That's good. Um, what's age the best for you, Sean? Hmm. I think you guys are real good. The best is like, it, it's almost like a precursor to scenes like um, 
Carl Weathers and Schwarzenegger, like, you know, high-fiving and then the zoom in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Predator, you know, there's like a couple of, they're, they're like intentionally hokey, melodramatic, but also iconic action movie moments. And a lot of the dialogue in the movie is stilted. Like, part of the reason I think younger people won't be as into this movie is because you don't realize that it's purposefully trying to do this comic book style, stentorian, almost like, it, it's, you know, it's based on a Greek tragedy. The reason they're doing it this way is to make it theatrical, yeah. you know, and the best. And the way it's like, no one is talking the way anybody actually talks. And I, I like that about it. So I, I love those, those lines of dialogue. What's it the best for you? I think for me, the Sean was alluding to this earlier, but the the world building that happens, like for after this movie, it came out and it was just like, all right, you can do anything you want in a movie. We have this elaborate gang network. We have this way that they all communicate. We're all sort of connected in this weird way. It's thousands of people existing in this sort of subculture and we all have rules and we all have like systems in place. That's cool. You see parts of that in in movies today, especially. Like when when I was watching it, the first movie I thought of was John Wick because they have the assassin network yeah. and all like that whole stuff is in there. Before this movie, we didn't have stuff like that. Right. To see it now is like, oh, it makes so much sense. That's why if you watch a movie, all of those pieces still sort of fit because you understand immediately, oh, I get, I get, I do get that part. If I don't understand the comic book theatrical Greek tragedy part of it. I understand what they're doing here with this part. That part, that's really like, that's undeniably cool. What do you say, Bill? Back to the baseball furies. <sighs> <laughs> I think Cyrus's age the best. Okay. Cyrus was awesome in the moment. And now it's just 40 years later, he just still works. This, this like life sucks. Here's this one guy who's going to give us hope and he doesn't really make sense. But this is basically how Trump got elected. Cyrus is oh, Cyrus versus Trump. The is proto Trump. It's own thing, but it's just like, I have the answers, but if you listen carefully, it's like, wait, this doesn't make any sense. Yep. But the speech is so good and he's so charismatic and so compelling. It's just like, I'm in. He's right. We can get these guys. Which is really good. It's really hard to pull off in a movie. It's a five minute scene and he just like crushes it. And then when he dies, it's like, yeah, I, I met the guy four and a half minutes earlier. It's like devastating. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, fuck, they killed Cyrus. You're right, though. Like, as an allegory for, you know, relevant and successful political leaders, it's, what do we vote for? You know, we vote for the people who are like, that person's cool. I, I like I like how they say what they said. Not necessarily what they said, but mm-hmm. how they're saying it. Right. And that's, that's what Cyrus I mean, honestly, is. Obama in 2008, he's going up there and he's like trying to give hope and he's doing Yes, We Can. And he was charismatic like that. And nobody really knew that much about him, but they were in because they just liked him. Yep. And they were mm-hmm. like, I like this guy. I want I want to buy into him. And so Cyrus has, in 1979, 100 gangs <laughs> <laughs> who are all like, why the fuck am I here? Within three minutes, he just has everybody and they're cheering, including real gangs. Yeah. Uh, what stage the worst? <sighs> A couple bad ones here, but uh, <laughs> Ajax is simultaneously a great character but he's also uh he's, he's aged badly so, he's, so the language is bad um he's a sexual assaulter mm-hmm. there, there's some, there's some issues we don't have to dwell on that but. i personally don't think that he's aged badly um this is a movie about it's, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like literally a movie about people who stalk the streets and probably commit crimes like the subtext of this movie is that if you're in a gang and you want to organize and beat the police you're committing a crime True. And if Ajax was like a good dude and super woke, it'd be like, why are you in a gang? Why right. aren't you like a like a middle school teacher? Mm-hmm. Um, and so him like ha- doing some terrible things, he obviously is in total contrast to Swan, who has this like... This you know, moral code to Yeah, him. this kind of King Arthur kind of quality about him. And he feels different in contrast. But like, I don't know, did it really age badly that like there was a bad guy in a gang in New York in 1979? That's pretty plausible. Probably. I was just saying some of the language and stuff. It's hard really to hear. Nitpick. You hear, you're like, yeah, it's like you could have just said, ooh, come bitch on, right there. Yeah, come true, on, AJ. You could have just said, motherfucker. True. We don't Mercy, the uh, orphan's girl, and some of the things they say to her isn't great. Tough. Yeah. Cleon dying has aged terribly for me. It really <laughs> fucking hurts my feelings every time. <laughs> Love Cleon. The stunt double getting thrown into the tracks and that character never being mentioned again mm-hmm. mm. has aged the worst. That would be my vote. You, re- you know that whole story? Yeah, I what, think we should talk about it. I don't know the story. What's the so story? They make this movie 
And the two stars are going to be Michael Beck, who plays Swan, who's the leader. Mm -hmm. And then the other guy is the guy Fox, who is the big curly haired guy who, when Cyrus gets shot, he's the one that sees that the rogues guy did it. He's kind of the number two. When they go to talk to the orphans, he's the guy with Swan. His, the actor's name was Thomas Waits, I think. That's right. And from the get-go, he's just feuding with Walter Hill, the director. And he's just being a dick and telling him what to do. And Walter Hill gets so fed up midway through the movie that he literally kills his character off and rewrites the last 45 minutes of it. <laughs> Initially, he's supposed to be the star of the movie. And he's like, fuck this guy. He fires him, finds some stunt double um, that is a crew member that just had the same hair. And if you watch that scene, everything's going nuts in Union Square. And then he grabs the girl and you see like the stunt doubles walking with Mercy, but you never really see his face. You see him from behind. Then a cop tackles him and then throws him into the train. And he's never mentioned again. Right, right, right. Because later the guys get back together near the end and they're like, what happened to Ajax? They got him. Nobody's like, what happened to Fox? Right. Oh, he Fox got thrown into uh, a train. So I can't remember a more dramatic firing during a movie where they just basically rewrote it on the fly. And I didn't even know that story until a couple of years ago. Because I think Gosh. he started talking about it when they were doing the uh, the 2015. They did this whole thing. It's online. They assembled the Warriors and they had them do the ride to Coney in the subway. Mm -hmm. All the guys now. And that, that guy was in it. And he told his whole story about how he got fired. Bizarre. That's, that's great. He, yeah, was, he was the one guy. So they do that zoom in of him seeing Luther yeah. shoot. And there's just something about his face that I didn't like. I was like, I hope this guy dies. Well, <laughs> you got your wish. Yeah. And then when he did, I was like excited. I was going to pick this same thing, but for a totally different reason. So with the, the way the movie is set up, we've got this gang who has to get from one place to the other. Yeah. And they've got to, you know, you've got to get there for some reason before the morning. And everybody's going to try to kill you. So it should be this very suspenseful, suspenseful thing. And when they kill him, when they kill that character, I felt like that was supposed to be the part where we go, okay, we now we understand what's at stake here. You can die if you don't get to this point. So by the time they get there, it should have been like this great feeling of relief. But the way that that scene is done, when the, when it happens, he dies and you're just like, the, like, that was really quick. I didn't get like the emotional impact. There's no payoff. Of yeah. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't make me feel nervous about the rest of the people. It's just like, whatever, a guy just got thrown in front of a train. I just don't like the way that that, that scene didn't hit. should have hit. It, it didn't work. I think it's because it's just so hamstrung together. You know? Can you remember in a movie that happening before? I mean, I can think Somebody of Somebody times... getting fired halfway through the movie and then just, just audibly with a death nine, scene? Nine brave souls. It's fucking crazy. If it Entourage. happened today, they would just recast. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like Eric Stoltz in Back to the Future. You know, right. it's just like, this isn't working. We got to get somebody else. So they get Michael J. Fox. Like, that's just what they would do. They wouldn't write the guy out of the movie midway through. They might do that on a TV show, but you wouldn't have to concoct like, in the middle of the night, a stunt coordinator trying to figure out how to throw a body onto a train to get rid of one of the four most important characters in the movie. It also causes a problem later when Swan, they fight the, the baseball furies, and then he goes back to see if he can find the others. At this point, a cop has thrown one of them into the trains. There's just no sign of anything. There's no, no ambulances there, no yep. police. Yep. It's just empty. It's like, what? there's a dead guy in front of a train. It's Why bizarre. were they running from the police? Because they're a gang? Yeah, they're a gang. They just assume that bad things are going to happen. They're wearing gang colors and they're in a place they shouldn't be. I think there's also a lot of stuff that's they're happening that night. Stuff. The fire that happens, we don't know who's responsible for that. The kind of police are on alert. Mm -hmm. the police, obviously, there was an assassination. It was a murder in the middle of the park that the cops were at and they were staking it out. So I think there's an awareness that there's trouble here and maybe the Warriors are at the center of the trouble. Maybe they're listening to the DJ. I think that's Smart a big, I think that's a big mistake that they made. That Smart move to start the fire, though. By the by, the other gangs. Oh, for sure. When the Warriors go. They're like, yeah. All right, okay, cool, guys. We're gonna start a huge fire, <laughs> yeah. five stops down. I like that. Smart the, strategy. The new who's the new guy who took over for Cyrus? Masai. Masai, yeah. Masai was pulling pulling all the it. strings. He was a predecessor of Masai Uhiri. Yeah, you know? he's he really, best friend really was. He knew how to pull the strings. Casting what ifs in the book. None of none of the characters were white. And Walter Hill said Paramount did not want an all black cast. Hmm. for commercial Let's do reasons. that movie. Yeah. Um, and then the only other one, Tony Danza <laughs> was supposed to be Vermin. This is the best. And Which was one? cast in the sitcom Taxi instead. So Vermin 
was cast with some guy, Terry Michos, who is now a news anchor in Wapanger Falls, New York. Oh my God. Vision. Which one's Vermin? Vermin is like the real slick he's Italian the American one. guy who's like, I got the big one. Yeah. Oh, you know? guy. yeah, yeah he's yeah. the comic relief guy. Let's take a break to talk about theblacktux.com. The Black Tux offers the kind of suits and tuxedo styles that would normally be wildly expensive to buy. And you might only wear once with the Black Tux, simply rent them online so you can blow it out for your one big time event. Take your style to the next level with the Black Tux's free home try on. You can see the fit and feel the quality of your suit months before your event. After ordering, your suit will arrive. How many days before the event, Kyle? 14. 14. Hey. There you go. If anything is less than perfect, the Black Tux will send you a replacement right away. Returns are simple. Just wear it, turn heads, send it back three days after your event. Shipping is free both ways. I have not used the Black Tux only because I have not been to a wedding in like. I, I can't even remember the last time I had to wear a tux for a wedding. Kyle, though, has been to one. We suited him up in the black tux. He looked fantastic. I might just have him just wear a tux when he's producing the podcast. Anyway, to get $20 off your purchase, visit theblacktux.com. Enter code REWATCHABLES. That is $20 off your purchase. Code REWATCHABLES. The black tux, premium rental suits and tuxedos delivered. Deanne Waiter's award. Heat check. I mean, it has to be Cyrus. It's it's he's in for four minutes, and it's one of the great heat checks ever. Mm. You could also make a case it's Ajax, or you can make a case it's Luther. I think it's it's. I think it's between Cyrus and Luther. Yeah, it's those two. And the battle, maybe they each one has to get a different award. One gets Saul Rubinek, and one gets Dion Waiters. I was right? going to give Luther uh, Saul Rubinek automatic. Cyrus, the stats of for him in that scene are pretty up there. Mm-hmm. He basically plays eight minutes and hits seven threes, and then comes out. Yeah, he needs the Dion the Dion waiter. I think board. he's got Dion. Yeah, half fast internet research. They rushed this movie to get ahead of another game movie called The Wanderers, which I had told Sean and I've somehow never seen. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen it either. It's Philip Kaufman though. It's the guy who made Did the right stuff. Well. You know, it's a it's a pretty big director. Ken Wall is in it. Who would eventually be the wise guy? Mm-hmm. Remember that show? Mm-mm. Really great drama. <laughs> check it out how old are you guys I feel like y'all y'all are very old right now I just now. watched a lot I'm of stuff I'm only 26 so just, <laughs> a lot of this stuff is is beyond me originally the character of Fox was supposed to end up with Mercy in that obviously when they had to murder him halfway through so I like didn't Swan happen. Swan is good wait are we sure that in the book so, and in the original script, Swan was captured by a rival homosexual gang known as the Dingoes only to escape later Hill, Walter Hill watched the dailies and realized that Beck and Van Valkenburg, who played Mercy, had great chemistry. So they rewrote everything, mm-hmm. got rid of the dingoes. A the dingoes, homosexual gang, the dingoes? Is that yes, what you said? Who had okay. Dobermans. That's In the not... book, they're a gay gang that has. Uh, that is that Dobermans. Has, that has Dobermans. That's a little bit like Halle Berry's dogs in John Wick 3. That's way more effective than a baseball bat <laughs> and some <laughs> the, face paint. The dingoes. The Dobermans. <laughs> The uh, the rogues were driving a 1955 Cadillac hearse. Mm-hmm. In case you were wondering what car that was, <laughs> Michael Beck partied too much during the filming and became a born again. Really? Okay. Yeah. okay. There you go. In one take, in the take when Swan throws the bat and hits the cop, Sonny Landon, the slow who motion. ends up being in Predator. Uh-huh. They did a take where he accidentally hit uh, Mercy's face and she had to go to the hospital and get stitches. Oh, no. And later in the movie, she got hurt when she was running with the stunt double before he gets thrown into the thing and broke her wrist. Jesus. And that's why she has that jacket on for the rest of the movie because Ah. they had to hide the broken wrist. (laughs) And he's like, where'd you get that jacket? He's like, I stole it from somebody. It's like, because she had a broken wrist. That line is always so weird to me. That makes total sense. I couldn't understand why she has the jacket. That that part's confusing. Oh, that's where they, they, she's because they're looking for somebody in pink. Yeah. So she put that on. So Trick, to film anywhere, me. to film anywhere in the five boroughs, production had to pay off whatever individual or gang ran that piece of turf. And they had a contact inside the NYPD who would tell Marshall, the producer, which gang members needed their palms greased. That's pretty cool. This is New That's York in cool. 1979, where it's like the NYPD is like, yeah, so you're all right, you're in the Bronx, you got to do the Van Cortland Rangers and give that money. Whatever. Amazing. Um, all right, we did all that. Apex Mountain. I mean, probably everybody in the movie except for James Remar. I think 48 Hours was his Apex Mountain, but you could say it was Sex in the City. Other than that, I mean, none of the movie. Mortal Kombat 2 was his Apex. Maybe, whatever. No, whatever. Uh, he, I would say Hill, he was a new rated. Lynn Thigpen's Apex Mountain is Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. Or she's, Sesame she's Street. She's the DJ or Sesame Street. Mm-hmm. Um, or uh, Lean on Me. 
which is great mm. and lean on me. <laughs> um, hmm. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else who had a major moment outside of, I mean, maybe uh, Terry Michos, the vermin, when he got the gig as the newscaster in yeah. Wappinger <laughs> Falls, New York. When I moved to LA, James Remar lived in my neighborhood and you just see him like having coffee outside. I was like, I'm so, so badly want to talk to James. I emailed two I, uh, of my favorite movies ever. <laughs> I interviewed James Remar once. He was the most straight talking person I've ever interviewed. He's a very serious dude. He, he, but he, he was like, he, this is my, as close as I can come. Here's the fucking thing, Sean. You got to remember when you're an actor, it's a lot of work. You have to remember that. I love it's those fucking guys. hard work. It's like great. he's just a very right. direct, always dropping F-bombs in the middle of sentences for no reason. He was nice, but he was just like hard-edged, hard-talking. I, I guess, I assume he's from New York. Yeah. Um, but he was, he was cool. He's an interesting guy. Well, he's also going to win the Joey Pants Award. Because I think most people know who he is, but they don't know his name's James Remar. I didn't know his, yeah. that was his name. What just, about Mercedes Rule? Well, she was the other one. I feel like Mercedes Rule became somebody. Oscar nominated. Hard not to, hard to totally know it's her in this movie. She's yeah. super young. She mm -hmm. ended up playing the uh, mom and big. And mm -hmm. what did she get nominated for? Is it um, the Fisher King? Yeah. Is that right? She uh, She's the undercover cop. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those two. Uh, would this movie have been better with Trey or Buscemi or Michael K. Williams? I think Michael K. Williams would have been incredible in this movie. I don't know. Which gang he should have been in, but I yeah, I drop know him, I, drop I know him I in anywhere. It. I think he really would have been nice as the as the new Messiah, as Gramercy Riffs mm. would have been great. Any anywhere as Cyrus. Him. Oh, Cyrus would have been I good. I want him as Cyrus. <laughs> well, maybe in the remake. Yeah, the Saul Rubinek they knew a word that clearly goes to Luther. He is going for it, man. Incredible stuff. <laughs> he's, in the, he's in the convenience store and she's like, hey, are you going to pay for that? He's like, for what? Yeah. <laughs> it's just out of his mind. I do like that part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, picking nits. So the Molotov cocktail that ruins the orphans. Mm -hmm. The orphans are, we're going to raid on you warriors. And then it's like, all right, we get the Molotov cocktail. They throw it in a car. And the and the orphans are just complete. Now you know why they're a, they're a D level gang. They were so bad. Yeah. One Molotov cocktail. They've they don't even know what to do. Yeah, they were not invited to the party for a reason. Yeah, they're pretty weak. That uh, was a, one of the notes I wrote down. Was they as were soon as they ran away. I was like, oh come on guys. Yeah, come on. I was rooting League. for the orphans. I mentioned how it's a little weird that there was no police or ambulances after one of the warriors dies at Union Station. Mm -hmm. The Lizzies. So they have the warriors. They're in a pretty confined space, not much bigger than the space we're in right now. <laughs> right. She has a gun. They're all there and fires like 19 shots and just misses everybody. Yep. Maybe don't have her as the shooter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like really, it's like these gangs were terrible. It's really the bottom line. It's yeah. a lot of missed opportunities for the gangs. Yeah. They should have, the orphan should have killed somebody. them. The, the, who are the ones in the bus? They should have killed them. Oh, the everybody. Turbo yeah, they were all fucking up. Why did Turnbull I see drive by the entrance where the guys are running up to go to the other entrance? You're in a bus. Come on. Just fucking run over them. Yeah. You're, it's you're, bad. yeah. And then uh I always wondered when when Swan throws the knife at Luther, right as Luther's shooting. Somebody behind There's him. There's three people behind Somebody him. should have got the hit. The knife hits him. Like, where did the bullet go? Did it go up? <laughs> just, just go through was it like a magic JFK bullet what happened <laughs> yeah that that's was a bad. really good question I don't Never understand can that. we just unpack that scene just a little bit more yeah let's do it um what what's going on with Luther's reaction to getting a knife in a in the hand like a knife in the hand I'm sure that would be painful in or the, the wrist I yeah. guess I'm sure that would be painful but like he basically goes down like I might I might die yeah like this might be the end of Luther <laughs> right and he's so dramatic <laughs> and all, all of the rogues are frozen they don't respond they don't rush at the Warriors, even though they've outnumbered them. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> Nobody rushes at the Warriors. It's Nobody a, uses numbers. It's I don't think anybody thing. liked Luther. Oh. I don't think even their team even liked mm, him Good at theory. All. Well, he also, when he charges Cleon at the beginning, Cleon just annihilates him. Yeah, yeah, he gets nailed right he's away. Bad. He's obviously not there for his fight. Luther's a bad leader. Yeah. I do he, like when he's, he's, a, like he's abusive. I just like doing things like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they only picked him because his chin was pointy. Mm. Somebody saw his chin and was like, you, sh you should wear a bandana yeah. and be this guy. Best quote, I'll shove that bat up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. My son's favorite quote. Wait, are we baby. done with picking nits? Oh, well, let's pick some. Because I feel like 200 of them. Okay, go. Okay, here's an easy one for your beloved Cyrus. There's no way everybody hears what he's saying. Oh, There's good, no chance. Yeah, I thought yeah, about that. At yeah. all. It's... He's take a little leap. He doesn't have that there. baso profundo, though. You know? Can you dig it? No, not you in a, not in a park outside with nine hundred gang members. Okay, you don't think the uh, 
the makeshift platform was maybe souped up for sound. <laughs> I don't think they thought so, that part like through. Sonos beams all over the place. Yeah. You mentioned the orphans running off at the fire. Big mistake. So are they actual orphans? Did they like grow up as orphans? They all have sort know. of dirty faces. Is that like their version of the face paint? That's a very good question that I don't have an answer to. <laughs> they have shirts with orphans on the back, but it's like not written. Mm-hmm. It's like a dirt. Like you have a little bit of money at least. <laughs> With the I don't underco- know if they did. With they the, had graphic mean, even, design, though. Yeah. With the undercover cop. Yeah. When she handcuffs him to the bench and starts blowing her whistle, it takes like a minute and a half. Like the, the, the why cops the get there very fast. They're far away. And then they yeah. fucking come flying in on the car. Yeah, that, that seems bad. You could have been like in the, behind the tree. What's Ajax thinking there? They're on this race to get home. It's the horny guy. His hormones got the best of him. Yeah. And he's a sexual assault or psychopath. He, yeah, he went in hardcore yeah. right there. He's got yeah. some issues. Because she was like, I'm with it. He's like, I'm with it too. Boom. Yeah. He misplayed that. Okay, this is a maybe this is because I live in Texas. I mean, I'm listening to you guys talk about all this New York stuff. But yeah. the whole time I'm watching this movie, I'm like, you don't fucking have one friend with a car? You can't make one phone call? With, and have somebody come pick you up? It's a good note. What's going on here? Just call somebody. So and- I wondered about, like, they picked the nine delegates from every gang. Mm-hmm. If you weren't one of the nine, it's like some some Terry Rogier, Jalen Brown type tension, right? <laughs> it's like your minutes. <laughs> yeah. Like, why aren't I one of the nine? The, That's I'm a the, good way for a team I'm chemistry the to fall most apart. Important person. But we're, yeah, you figure the 10th guy might have a car. The it's other thing, note, too, is that you'd think... So theoretically, there's a hundred other members of the gang based on Cyrus's speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where are the other warriors? Why do the warriors only have nine members? Right. We never hear anything about any other members of the gang. Yeah, where were the other ones waiting for them when they got back? Yeah. Why wouldn't they call them on a payphone and say, hey, we need backup. We're going to have a showdown. Yeah, we might have some shit going down. Yeah. We're being framed. Why didn't more gangs go to Coney Island and just beat the shit out of the remaining warriors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know where we're from. What were those guys doing that night? I don't know, it's a little bit like, what was Michael Corleone doing, you know, between 1946 and 1951, just sitting on his ass, is that what you're saying? going to grad school, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) What he was doing. And then at the end, when he says they're the best, they're not the best. You like several of your people die. Yeah, that's not the best. The riffs are clearly the best. They did fight their way 28 miles from the Bronx to Coney Island. I don't know. They they, They made a lot of mistakes. Real good. It's great, great stuff. It would have been funny if he said the best and, and the, and the, Gramercy Riffs guys like, well, I mean, it'd be fair the baseball furious should have beaten you. They did have nine guys. Yes. I mean, that was Truly. ridiculous. It was complete <laughs> strategy error by them. Best quote, I'll shove that bat up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. I'll shove that bat up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. Come on. Warriors come out to play. Can you dig it? The Warriors are good, real good. The best. I don't know what the answer is. My favorite quote is, I'll shove that bat up your ass, turn you into a popsicle. Mm-hmm. But I think the iconic quote is probably the Warriors come out to play. Yeah, I think that's lasted that's 40 one. years. Definitely. Warriors come out to play. Warriors come out to play. It's between that one and Can You Dig It? And Can You it's Dig It's good yeah. too. Could this be re- remade as a 10 episode Netflix show? In 2016, yes, Hulu and Paramount Television, and they got writers and people started working on it. What happened? I don't know. It's an idea that's been sitting there my entire life, basically. And now you think about it in the cell phone, Twitter era, what does it look like? Right. That's probably- the, I know the, I want to at least see the attempt at this point. Yeah. That's probably the one hurdle that you that's hard to get past, is this whole movie looks different. If there's no, if there's a cell phone involved, it, it's totally Agree. different. But if you if you do make it and you said it back then before cell phones, that's a fun, that's a fun TV show. You have it so that every episode you meet a new gang. That's what I was thinking too. I think yeah. it's focused on one different gang each each episode. Yeah. So could you set it in like 1995, like right before the internet, basically? Yeah, you set it whenever, oh. as long as there's no cell phones around, or we just pretend like cell phones don't exist. Maybe that was if part of the truth. If we're just no making shit up, let's make up that there's no cell phones. The cell phones is a huge obstacle for the It's remake. a problem. It's a problem. Also, I Uber know. Uber is a bit of an issue, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, I feel like Uber might kind of solve this movie pretty quickly. <laughs> it kind of makes me want to see the remake more, though, when you add all the technology to this idea. Mm-hmm. What does that look like? Yeah. Hmm. 
maybe it's like at a time when there's a blackout or you know people are maybe maybe it has to be more post apocalyptic. I think this movie is supposed to be set slightly in the future. Yeah. I think it's not supposed to be necessarily present day New York. So maybe there has to be just a little bit more Mad Max on it to make it make sense. I think one person that loses their job is the DJ in the remake. Think so? Yeah. Who's a, DJs don't have that kind of power It's just now. a podcaster. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, the it's just somebody podcast. going live on Periscope, you know? So, uh, unanswerable. I, the answer is I would like to see somebody at least try it. We have 500 TV shows. Everybody has, there's a million TV show ideas right now. This seems like that could work. Probably unanswerable questions. Who are the words who didn't get invited? We talked to that. Would a radio station with a DJ communicating in codes to gangs really have worked in 1979? Wouldn't the police have just listened to that radio station and found out what was going no, on? No, I don't. They were too smart about it. I think that's like an underground situation. We just don't know. We're not saying. We're not saying it. Nobody's hey, going to tell anybody anything about this. Our baseball fear is struck out, and it looks like our boys are still going. Yeah. Now here's Jackson Brown running out of <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I really like that part of it. I think that that to me was the most clever part of the movie. How do we get all this information to all of these people all at the same time? Oh, I got it. I agree. It's, it's really clever. Plus, you got Lynn Thinkpen. You got that shot is so cool of just her mouth against the sort of like pink red light mm-hmm. and then dropping the needle onto records. That stuff is really slick and cool looking. Yeah. Also unanswerable. Um, how long did Swan and Mercy stay together, you think? Maybe like a week? <laughs> yeah, tops. She's like, it's kind of far to get out here. I don't want to, this is not going to work. I don't, uh, I don't know. I feel he like- probably had to see her after a shower at least to get a really good look at her. She hadn't showered in about a week. I the feel dirty like feet. Deborah Van Valkenburg should have had a better career. She was, So she was in Too Close for Comfort, which was uh, a Ted Knight sitcom that I feel like was borderline iconic, but it was early <laughs> 80s. <laughs> I just love Ted I Knight. I definitely saw Too Close for Comfort. Um, uh, it was her... She was the brunette sister and the other one was like the blonde bimbo sister that mm-hmm. was like this character that was going on for, you know, Suzanne Summers and Three's Company and Lonnie Anderson, WKRP, and this was in this one. And uh, and she was good in that. She was like the smart, sassy daughter. Yeah. She's and got that spark. Was it. You know, there's something about her. I'm surprised she wasn't more successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She was good. The gangs in the movie. Oh, I forgot about the uh, the unanswerable questions. Ajax, probably dead within three years. So he gets, he just in goes to jail, jail, right? That's what happens to but him. he gets out, but then he like does an armed robbery where he gets shot. Ajax doesn't live to see 25, I don't feel like. I, I, want, I want to see the other version of that where he, Ajax gro- he grows up. Around? Yeah, he grows up to be the rich guy from Sex and the City. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same person. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I want. Theory. That'd be good. He used to be Ajax. Before we do who won the movie, the gangs. <laughs> so here are the gangs. All right. And where their locations were. The Gramercy Riffs. Thumbs up. The rogues who Thumbs killed down. Cyrus from Hell's Kitchen. Okay. This, this is another, all according to the book. This is another nitpick. I just yeah. remember this one. Uh, why don't you just have the gun ready? We see like the shot of them passing the why gun down, people the, doing it? Yeah, down the line to him. Like you should have had the gun. I think it's for time. dramatic effect. Okay. So I think it's because it wasn't even planned. Somebody else had the gun and Luther is crazy and is making decisions on a whim and he calls for the gun mm-hmm. and then they pass it. So it's not like he, it's not like it was even his gun. Right. It just happened to be among the rogues and they decided while, while Cyrus was talking to do it. That's my, that's my theory. Turnbull ACs were located wherever that was supposed to be in the Bronx. Yeah. So there's somewhere around there. Uptown. The orphans were in. Poor orphans. It seemed like Brooklyn. Almost, or the, or the I mean, Bronx, it's only or? halfway through the movie, so they wouldn't be that far south yet. No, they wouldn't be in Brooklyn. So I, they never really say where that is. Baseball Furies, it's right near Union Square, 96 and Broadway. Where is that? Union Square and 96 and Broadway are nowhere near each other. 96 and oh, Broadway were, is Upper West Side, Union Square is 14th So they were Street. 96 and Broadway trying yeah. to get to Union Square. Yeah, so that's sort of like Upper, Upper West Side yeah. before you get into Harlem. So that that ties in with your whole, these are some uppity rich kids yeah. trying to start their own gang and dressing up like baseball players. Yeah. <laughs> Bunch of like <laughs> bar prep school flunk outs, you know? Yeah. yeah exactly. Prep school kids. Have either of y'all ever been in a gang or even like a pretend gang when you were growing up? Was that no. the thing that you did? No. No. Can't it wasn't on my list. Okay. You want to talk about your, your experiences? We, we, yeah, you, we did it, but it was like a... It was a fake gang? It was a fake gang. This is the thing. We were pretending we'd heard about a gang called the Bloods. Yeah. Obviously very popular. That's a yeah, known gang. Them, yes. And we're like, oh, we're going to tell people that we're with them. Because we saw, we learned like 
somebody's cousin learned how to make the blood symbol, mm -hmm. this thing. Mm. So we learned how to, we all learned how to do it. And we're like, we're going to be that. And then we were at the mall together, like four of us, and we saw actual real bloods. And we were like, this is not, we're not this. No, thank you. I hope the Crips aren't watching this. <laughs> <laughs> Baseball fear is, we're going to say 96th and whatever. The Lizzie's somewhere in Union Square. Okay. The punks. So these ones are all in the book and people on the Lower internet seem pretty confident. Yeah, they were the Bowery. Gotta be Lower East Side. That was the, the guy with the roller skates. Now, if you watch the opening credits, the boppers, they were the guy who looked like the guys, they were black guys who looked like uh, they were in the... Uh, oh, the purple? They were. They looked like they were headed to some Motown concert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're from Harlem. Okay. Their rival was the Hurricanes, also from Harlem, which are briefly shown. The mimes were called the hi-hats. <laughs> <laughs> sure. They Why were, not just the mimes? I, they, were, they were the hi-hats from Soho. How do the mimes okay. feel? Artistic community. Feel about the baseball furies. I I don't I don't know if they ever interact. Are they squaring off and just nobody's talking shit to anybody? Pretty much. Okay. The uh the big rival for the hi hats was the electric eliminators, which you see briefly. You see their jackets. Is these guys yes. they're wearing like these satin baseball jackets and it says electric eliminators oh, yeah, in yeah, the yeah, back? Yeah. Terrible name. Rough yeah. name. Really bad. That's a lot of letters. Yeah. And they were also in Soho. So then we had two ben Bensonhurst groups. Oh, that's the reminding. Saracens, who were the guys in the blank tack tank tops. I'm go I'm pro Saracens because of Matt Saracen. And then the jo and then the Jones Street Boys. I'm so Cyrus I'm calls those Street guys Boys. out in the beginning. He's like, "We got the Saracens next to the Jones Street Boys." It's both Bensonhurst. What's Bensonhurst like now? It's nice, right? Um, it's a very ethnic community. <laughs> uh, I a lot of family a... from Bensonhurst. Yeah, it's 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 fine. It's suburb. It's kind of suburbanish. I, I, I wonder if the Jones Street Boys are still there. I thought that was a person, Bensonhurst. I was like, oh, was he in? Bensonhurst. Yeah, yeah, no idea Robert what you're talking about. Uh, the motorcycle gang was called the Satan's Mothers. You see them very briefly in the crowd shot. The Satan's Mothers. Yes. That's just the kind of, Satan's mother. Kind of grammatically confusing. I, How many mothers does Satan down. have? Maybe I wrote that down wrong, and it's just Is it a, it's mothers. a male gang called it's the Satan's, be Satan's mothers. mothers. Yeah, uh, they were in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> the Moon Runners were in the Bronx. So were the Van Cortland Rangers. I That's love the Van Cortland Cyrus calls Rangers. them out too. Van Cortland Rangers, great, great, probably man. the best gang name. That sounds like an EPL them. team. <laughs> <laughs> the gang in the beginning that's paying the subway respectfully, the tokens. Yeah, the yeah, one yeah. guy's just putting the tokens in and everybody's oh, yeah. going through. That's like, the gladiators. I don't I know like, where they're I from. I like that. That's funny. Like on a, they're on a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one, the Boyle Avenue Runners from Queens. Ah. Uh, which you see briefly. And then this is my favorite one. You see these guys, it's very brief, but they're waiting on the subway to go to the thing. They're all Asian guys. This is the Savage Huns of Chinatown. Has incredible gimmick. Has well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> incredible gimmick. The Savage Huns? That's not great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of Chinatown. I don't know. Apparently, they uh, might have cut them out. Yeah. Of, uh, Wait, of how, many, how many racist things can we have in one name? Yeah. Give me all of them. Seriously. Um, and did I get everybody? I saw a lot. Yeah, so, 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 so 21. 21, okay. So, I going through Chinatown would have been an interesting move in this movie. There's just so many other parts of Brooklyn. I'm surprised there weren't more Brooklyn. Because, you know, to go from the top of Brooklyn, essentially, down to Coney Island, is far. It's really far. So I, I checked out the map last night long to trip. prepare for this. And I was like, God damn, Coney Island's like really far away from really like where far. our office is in Brooklyn. Where's our office in Brooklyn? It's in Brooklyn Heights, which Brooklyn is Heights, right which is over the bridge. It's the very top right over yeah. the bridge. And then you look where Coney is and it's like, damn. It's very far away. I mean, I, I took a lot of train rides there. They used, they put, used to put on a Village Voice used to put on a music festival there. And I would go there probably once a year in the summer. And the only reason to not go was because it was fucking two and a half hours on the train just to get down to Coney Island. Because you have to change trains yeah. and take an unreliable trains. So yeah, I could see why this would be a, an arduous journey for the Warriors. How many miles is it though? So it's it's 28 from the Bronx to Brooklyn, but I think just going from like where our office is in Brooklyn to Coney Island is like another 10, right? It's a no, long I'm ride. not sure what the mileage is, but it's far. And it's a lot of stops. That's oh. the other thing we don't see is enough train stops. Like how did they catch the express at like three o'clock in the morning? That's not easy to do. All of the stuff that y'all are saying about New York just doesn't make any sense to me. 
because I'm all in. Like yeah, everything in, like in everything in Houston thing. is 30 minutes away, mm-hmm. and it's, that means it's 25 miles away. Here's the thing about New York: it is incredibly poorly designed. Yeah, yeah. it's just so, such an inefficient place to live. It, it seems more, like it's inefficient, but it's really small and it's hard to get around. Yeah. When I was looking at the map, it was so clear that they just need more bridges. Mm. Like three more would be really nice. Yep. It's not really easy to build a bridge, just for the record. There's like a whole book about this. So, <laughs> so what gang would you have wanted to be in? I, I listed 21. Uh, first, let me be in the Saracens. Only Saracens, because, of Matt, because of Matt Saracen. Okay. My second choice would be the Gladiators because they were respectful enough to pay. Respectful gang. I, I do like that. I want to be in the roller skate gang only if I can be the roller skate guy. Like the lead guy. That's good. So do you think when he abdicates his throne, the next guy also has to know how to do there's roller a, There's skating? a whole ceremony yes, where they're the, handing the roller the, skates the, over. The skates over. Those are, those are my three picks. <laughs> Turnbull AC is as cool of a band, a uh, gang as it was. I, it also seems like they were probably the skinheads, so maybe not, maybe remove them off the list. But white and black. Yeah. Like that's, oh, that's progressive. That's a progressive skinhead yeah. gang. What do you think their gimmick was? Just like to be shaved head scary dudes? Hating everybody? Yeah. I don't know. Somebody, had, around somebody the had a bus. bus. We've got a bus. And a and a two by four. I think the Van Cortland Rangers, just best name. Mm-hmm. I don't like that name. Excited. I don't understand why y'all like the that. The Van so Cortland much. Rangers? Yeah. I like it. it I just think the, who are the electric the electric what's? Well, the electric eliminators is terrible. I think I that's a, I I think that's be a better that name. Because if you're the Van Cortland Rangers, you're the VCRs. That's dope. That's bad. No, I like that. If you, but if you're the other ones, you're an eliminator. Eliminators are cool. And you're also, ele- I like electricity. Uh-huh. Electricity is great. Yep. I like to eliminate things. <laughs> Fucking, we're checking out both of the lists. <laughs> Where's, what's Hell's Kitchen situation in 2018? Mm-hmm. It's nice. It's expensive to live there. There are some ringer staffers who live there. I won't name names. Um, it's on the far west side in Midtown. Uh, it used to be tough, really tough part of New York City. Um, that's famously where Matt Murdock, Daredevil, the Marvel character, lives. Um, but it's nice now. You think Luther still lives there or no? Like if Luther were still alive, if he didn't die from a wrist injury? Well, <laughs> wrist injury <laughs> and getting beaten by a hundred people. Um, do you think they killed him at the end? That should be an, an, an unanswerable I did, question. I think not only did they kill him, I think they killed him slowly they over the him. course of many, many days. Oh, wow. I think they brought him back to that weird dark compound, that weird dark cement parking garage, yeah, where was wherever that? that was. They were all lined up like military style too, which I thought was, like there's a reason they, they were the most intimidating. They were clearly the most organized of all the groups. They seem like precursors to like the S1Ws, the public enemy dancers, you know? There's some that sort of like the, the black militant identity of that group is a uh, is like, it's like post-Black Panthers, but pre kind of public enemy and, yeah. and that whole movement and rap. It was interesting. And then it's like the soldiers dress a certain way, but then the the hierarchy, the, they don't have to wear the kung fu outfits basically. Was there a Mexican gang? Or, no, I mean we had the the one Asian gang that didn't work out great for I guess them. I, I guess let me join those guys then. I the Mexican to, the Mexican Asian alliance were super were like we're connected. I need to join I'm trying them. To think. If there's no Mexican game. If there's there no like to have been like Las Sucias, if there's not them, then they didn't put enough thought into that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Gramercy, by the way. Gramercy's nice now too. Isn't it? Beautiful. It's one of the nicest parts of New York City. So why were the rifts located in Gramercy? New York in the 70s is completely different. I have, I actually don't know specifically what Gramercy was like back then. Gramercy now is very Tony. I mean, that's where uh, Gramercy Tavern is, one of the nicest restaurants in the city. It's There's a gated community in the middle of Gramercy Park. Yeah. It's very, very nice, nice part of New York. Who won the movie? I'm going with Walter Hill, the director, because I think he created a prototype for everything that was about to come with that. That's a good movies. pick. That's a good, smart pick. But I didn't know his name until you said it on this podcast. You like Swan. You like I do how like, Swan handled his I, business. I do like Swan a lot. Swan to me seemed, number one, he was like a sweetheart. He was clearly trying to take care of all those people. He was smart. But also, he wasn't afraid to turn it up a little bit when he needed to. Like when they stood off against the orphans, his first instinct was, let's just get to this peacefully until he got challenged. And he's like, you know what? Fuck you guys. We're just going to do what we want to do. Yeah. I like Swan. But I don't think he won the movie. I, Luther clearly won the movie. He's the one person everybody knows. He's the only person. You could play that clip anywhere. If you just play Warriors, somebody's going to know the next four words. You can make case Cyrus won the movie too, even though he dies. You can make the case that uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson won the movie for ripping off Cyrus's <laughs> whole bit. Um, he really did. I've never heard him 100% talk about it. 
But I remember when he was coming up in WWE, I was like, this guy's doing fucking Cyrus. It's awesome. What a great idea. It's really funny. <laughs> Keep this going. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a case for New York. There's this great story that Andrew Laszlo tells. Um, he's the cinematographer of the movie where he and Walter Hill are talking and they're afraid it's going to rain during the shoot. And if it rains during the shoot and you're shooting at night, um, it's tough because, you know, the film is not shot chronologically. So you'd have water on the ground or you'd have rain coming down and you have to account for that as you travel through the city. So they did set up a scene early in the movie. This was Laszlo's idea to have a rain sequence, you know, when they run under run for cover, you know, when they're first kind of racing uh, after the assassination. And then after that, they wet down the streets every night. And what you get is this glimmer off the ground. That's sort of like that beautiful post-rain shimmer effect. Yeah. Um, and it makes New York look really cool. It makes all the neon lighting look amazing. All the colors that they're trying to make in the movie, it kind of elevates it. And it also just makes New York look like um, it's like a dingy crystal palace. You know, there's like yeah. something about it that is like <laughs> both beautiful and ugly at the same time. Um, it's just a cool movie to just see New York at that time. Even more so than like Serpico or Dog Day Afternoon. Like you're seeing all different parts of the city. So uh, my vote is New York. That rain thing was something they did in Miami Vice season one. Mm. That was like a big thing. If you look at a lot of like the night shots, the, the streets are always wet, even though it had never rained. And then that became a thing. I it, think a lot of people do that. But I, I do think you're right. I think the Warriors might have started that. It's a cool trick. Yeah. Very, very smart move by the, the cinematographer. Hmm. That's it, guys. That was fun. Were you convinced that the Warriors is maybe better than when we started this podcast? It's more influential. I mean, I never doubted that part, mm -hmm. but to just sit down and watch it. You need them hooks in you as a kid. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe you were a crip. <laughs> no, blood. A blood. Blood. I can't believe you were a blood. What a mistake. So the real gang in our neighborhood, they were called the Northside Rowdies. And we were like too scared to join those ones. That's a good name. Yeah. They could have been in this. So we made could our own. Could have replaced the electric eliminators with the <laughs> Northside Rowdies. It was really bad. When mm. I became a teacher later, I lied about, I was in a gang about being in the Bloods because I knew the sign. And so, several of our kids in the area were that. And I connected. So it worked out. Sean, Shay, a pleasure as always. Thanks, Bill. <laughs>